started. We don't want to be too late. So Michelle, um, who is the one of the co-founders of Money Out Voter Then, is going to start us off. She's actually in Sacramento mm -hmm. lobbying for AB 83 right now, the past couple of days. And she's going to tell you all about why we are here to follow the foreign money. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks, Holly. Um, welcome to all of you uh, to the uh, Movi Money Out Voters In and Free Speech for People Follow the Foreign Money webinar, where we'll drill down to learn how to discover if the U.S. corporation is a FIBI, a foreign influenced business entity. My name is Michelle Sutter, and I'm the president and co founder of Movi Money Out Voters In. And we are the California sponsors of AB 83, the Get Foreign Money Out of California Elections Act. Joining this call today and facilitating our education will be Holly Mosher, whom you just heard from, Movi's Director of Outreach and Communication, um, and, uh, uh, and whom each of you have heard from in the run-up to this event, and Ron Fine, the Legal Director of Free Speech for People, Ron has prepared a video to walk us through each step of this process of naming names. So we, uh, so we could avoid technical issues was why this is a video. The video is about 20 minutes long and I think you'll be amazed by what it's possible to learn from publicly available data. And Ron is here on the call and will uh, be able to answer any questions after the video. Then um, Holly, will show us how to use that information to discover how these foreign influenced corporations are spending their money in politics. Um, I think this will be a very fun and informative hour. And before we get started, I'd like to turn to Alexandra Flores Quilty, Campaign Director for Free Speech for People, to bring us some updates on this model legislation to close the loophole Citizens United created for foreign money in our elections and what's going on um, all around the country. Thank you so much. And Alexandra, over to you. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks everyone for tuning in today. Thank you to Movi um, for organizing this fantastic uh, webinar. Um, just briefly, I wanted to share some uh, uh, updates and context about how this model legislation has been advancing around the country. Um, it's now been uh, about three years since Seattle had the uh, uh, very exciting and landmark um, passing of uh, this type of model legislation that prohibits foreign influence corporate spending in elections. Uh, Seattle City Council passed it after Amazon spent over a million and a half dollars in the 2019 election to try and um, remake the Seattle City Council, uh, Amazon being a foreign influence corporation. Uh, and so it became clear to the City Council all the need, uh, all the more need to why they need to pass this type of, of legislation. I want to highlight also with that that Fix Democracy First, uh, a Washington based local organization, um, was, was key in leading the fight there. And we were proud to, to support them in passing this in Seattle. Um, and then just recently, uh, uh, as of last Friday, um, Minnesota became the first state in the nation to end foreign influence corporate spending uh, 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 by passing this policy. Um, last Friday, the governor signed it into law. Um, it, this was included within the Democracy for the People Act, an omnibus democracy bill, uh, which is designed to strengthen voting rights, protect voters and the election system, uh, and includes a number of key uh, uh, democracy reforms, but specifically included this critical policy to end foreign influence corporate spending in elections. Um, so Minnesota is now the first state in the country uh, that we can look towards, and we hope that California and uh, other states all over are, won't be far behind. Um, uh, I'll also just highlight some of the places where it's pending. So this legislation is pending in the state of Hawaii, Massachusetts, New York, Washington State, and of course, uh, California. Um, and then federally, Congressman Jamie Raskin of Maryland is, is championing this in the U.S. Congress. Um, and it's also been included by Senator Elizabeth Warren uh, as a part of her broad anti-corruption bill um, as a key policy provision within that. Um, so that's a little bit of a lay of the land. I'll pass it back to Michelle. 
Thank you, Alexander. That's a great update. Yes, we're, we're so excited about Minnesota um, and great work to everyone there. Um, and um, I think now, uh, Oski, are we ready to play the video? Yes, I'll start sharing my screen and we'll get the video started. And, and just remember, you're going to see the video and then we will go through this together with the company that you've been assigned. We'll take a few minutes after this video to make sure you know which company is yours. Um, you might not have gotten the one you wanted, but watch this, pay attention, and then we will go through this all together again with your company. So, and we're here to answer questions, so don't get nervous. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ron Fine, the legal director at Free Speech for People, a national nonpartisan nonprofit. And along with our allies at the Center for American Progress and state and local partners around the country, we've helped develop legislation to ban corporate political spending by foreign influenced companies. And in this video, I'm going to show you how using your own computer, you can determine to a reasonable degree of confidence which companies would qualify under this legislation. But first, let me briefly put on my lawyer hat and address a few preliminary legal and practical questions before we get into the brass tacks of how to determine which companies qualify. I'll see you in a few minutes. There are three U.S. Supreme Court decisions that govern this question. The first is Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission from 2010. In that case, the Supreme Court extended the right to spend money on elections to corporations, but with an important caveat. The court described the corporations to which its decision applied three times as associations of citizens, and it said specifically that it was not deciding any questions regarding companies that were funded by foreign investors. The second case, decided just a few years after Citizens United, although less well known, is Blumen versus Federal Election Commission. In that case, the Supreme Court upheld a decision from the lower courts written by Judge, now Justice, Brett Kavanaugh, in which Kavanaugh wrote that a law, still in effect today, that bans political spending of any amount by foreign entities directly in U.S. elections is constitutional and it can be justified because it helps protect American democratic self-government. The third decision, written by Justice Kavanaugh in 2020, is called U.S. Aid. And in that case, the Supreme Court held that foreign entities abroad have no constitutional rights whatsoever, and that associating themselves with U.S. entities or U.S. individuals doesn't give them the constitutional rights of those Americans. Putting these together, a corporation that has substantial foreign investment is not an association of citizens. And furthermore, the concerns about the threat to democratic self-government that Justice Kavanaugh identified apply. A wealthy foreign investor can't spend its own money directly in U.S. elections in any amount. So it follows that that same wealthy foreign investor can't buy a stake in a U.S. registered company and then leverage its influence in that company to affect how the corporation spends its treasury funds on U.S. elections. And that is why the bill that would ban political spending by foreign influenced companies is constitutional. Before we get started, let's talk about a couple of limitations to this method. First of all, it relies solely on publicly obtainable information. Some of this is from government sources, some of this is from private sources. The important point is that this is not how the companies themselves will determine who their investors are. Publicly traded corporations have more precise techniques for determining every shareholder and their address and how many shares they own. They do this at least once a year for their annual meetings, sometimes more often. In some cases, other shareholders can get access to this type of information, but it's not what the general public has. And so we're using lesser quality, lower detail sources, but that's okay for the purpose we're using them for, because this method is not intended for compliance or enforcement purposes. This is not a basis to say that a company is so definitely a foreign influence company that it must be violating the law if it's spending after this law has passed. Rather, this is intended for use with activists and legislators and maybe in op-eds, where you want to say, here's an example of the type of company that would be covered by this type of bill. Now, another issue is that this method 
Uh, it doesn't have a lot of false positives, but it will have some false negatives. Now, on the false positive side, it's unlikely that if you run through this method and you find evidence that a company uh, qualifies under the bill, it's unlikely that that would be a, a false positive. It could happen, but it's unlikely. What's more likely is that in some cases you won't be able to determine for sure that a company is foreign influenced. That doesn't mean it isn't. It just means that this method doesn't give you the evidence that it is. So we very rarely would say, oh, this company is definitely not foreign influenced. You wouldn't say that. You would just say, oh, we don't have any evidence that it would qualify. And the last point is that the ownership of publicly traded companies changes on a, a regular basis. And that has a couple of different implications. For purposes of your analysis, what it can mean is that even the examples you'll see in this video between when I recorded them and when you might run through them for the exact same company, you might get different results. And that's totally normal. It also means that out there in the real world, a company might qualify as a foreign influence company uh, in January, but by March it isn't, or the other way around, because foreign investors have bought or sold stock. And the practical implication of this for you is that if you are preparing materials for a, a legislator to review or for other purposes, and you ran an analysis on a company a couple of months ago, you want to rerun that analysis as if you hadn't done it. Uh, and, and do it fresh because the data could be different. What it means for the way the law actually works once enacted is that the company is required to certify that it wasn't a foreign influence company on the day that it made a political contribution or expenditure. So they have a fixed date to look at. So those are the limitations to the method and now we can get into the details. Here's a quick overview of how we're going to screen for foreign influence companies. We're going to start at CNBC.com. That company uses uh, data sources that combine public and proprietary data to give some information about uh, shareholder holdings. We're going to first see if the aggregate foreign ownership is 5% or more by looking at geographic concentration. Then we're going to look at the list of top institutional and mutual fund foreign investors to see if any of them hold 1% or more. We're going to double check on the MSN Finance or MSN Money website, which has some additional information. And then we'll talk about how you can know if an investor is foreign. And finally, I'll talk briefly about privately held companies. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to determine aggregate foreign ownership. So for example, if we wanted to do this for Uber, we would go to CNBC.com. We would look up Uber on its stock ticker website. We would scroll down to a list of tabs that's summary news, profile, earnings, peers, financials, options, and ownership, and we would choose ownership. That would give us a geographic picture of where the shareholders are located. You can see in this picture that uh, Europe and Asia and to some degree Africa and Australasia together combined add up to well over 5%. So that triggers the 5% aggregate threshold. Now we're going to look at how we determine single 1% institutional investors. On that same screen on CNBC, you'll see top institutional holders, and that will give you a list of the top 10 largest single institutional investors. And some of them uh, are pretty clearly uh, foreign. So if you look at the bottom of this list, you'll see Morgan Stanley Investment Management of Singapore. Uh, that is not the Morgan Stanley that you might have in your neighborhood. That is the Singapore company. Uh, some you need to know a little bit more about. Um, you see Public Investment Fund. That is actually the Public Investment Fund of Saudi Arabia. Uh, and you can, uh, we'll talk a little bit later about how you can research uh, any one of these to determine its foreign status. You'll also scroll down and you'll look at the list of top mutual fund investors. Uh, if you look at this list, you'll see uh, next to bottom from the list with 1.2% of shares outstanding is Staten's Pension Fund Utland, which the name itself suggests that it is not a US investor. And in fact, it is a Norwegian uh, mutual fund. We'll also look at the MSN, I guess it's MSN Money, not MSN Finance uh, site, um, which uh, lists uh, some additional investors beyond the top 10. Uh, and we'll just make sure, uh, sometimes you could have, let's say, 12 investors that all own 1% uh, or more of stock. And uh, although the CNBC site, CNBC site is in general superior, um, it only lists the top 10. So uh, MSN Finance would go beyond that. 
Now, how do you know if an investor is foreign? So sometimes the investor's name gives it away, like if Singapore is in the name. Uh, in some cases, though, it, you need to look up the investor's own corporate website. So for example, one investor you might see is Temasek Holdings. If you Google that, you'll see that its URL is not temasek.com, but temasek.com.sg. .sg means Singapore. Uh, often a company will have a, a web a page on its website with a name like corporate governance or investors that will have that sort of uh, company information like where it is registered, where it holds its annual meetings, the laws of which country it's organized under. So usually the investor's own corporate website will give you information like that. And sometimes it can be tricky when you have a multinational conglomerate where there's holding companies and they all share one single website and you're not totally clear from CNBC whether it's uh, the U.S. affiliate or the French uh, conglomerate that has invested in a, an American company. So, uh, you know, at some point it, it can be tricky, but often it's not. The, the final point, though, is that you can build a convenient list of repeat players in this field because overall there aren't that many foreign companies that tend to hold major stakes in S&P 500, for example, companies. Uh, here are an, an example list of four that you'll see a lot, uh, and once you know that they're foreign, you'll spot them right away. And what do you do about privately held companies? Here, it's much harder to get reliable information. Some of them are very open about it. There's really no question as to who owns them. Um, you can find it on their own website uh, or uh, maybe on, even on Wikipedia. We don't want to totally rely on Wikipedia, but if, if Wikipedia makes it pretty clear that it's, for example, owned by one individual who's American, it's usually not worth contesting that. Uh, some companies, especially LLCs in the real estate field, which are often formed to invest in one particular piece of property, it can be really difficult uh, to find out their, uh, their owners. Uh, which could, of course, be other LLCs, um, which then have their own uh, investors. There is a new federal legislation that takes uh, effect in 2024 that is supposed to bring some transparency to this. But uh, in the meantime, it can be really hard to get information about privately held companies uh, in, in some cases. And so at a certain point, it, it may not be worth chasing it down any further. Okay, now we're gonna look at how to determine aggregate foreign ownership. So I'm going to cnbc.com. That's a site that has a finance lookup. And I'm gonna to go to this window right here where it says search quotes, news, and videos. And I'm gonna start with Uber. I wanna find out if Uber meets the threshold for aggregate foreign ownership. So I'm gonna just type in the name of the company and you'll see that it has different stock symbols here. And the right one here is the one that's just Uber on top. So when I click this, it's gonna bring up some information for Uber Technologies Incorporated. That's the name of the company. Now what I wanna do is scroll down and come over here where it says ownership. And this is gonna give me a nice geographic picture where it says shareholders concentration. Now, the first thing to know about this data is that it comes from a variety of public and not so public sources. And what you're gonna see is that they list by continent with some uh, idiosyncrasies. So for example, they've grouped the US and Canada together as North America, and then they have uh, Europe, Africa, Asia, Australasia, and then almost no data whatever for South Central America in which they've inexplicably included Mexico. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the attribution of foreign ownership to continents that definitely do not include the United States. So if we look here, we can see Europe has 7.2% of Uber stock and Asia has 2.3%. So right there, that's 9.5%. Throw in 0.2% from Africa, 0.1% from Australasia, and you've got 9.8% of Uber stock at minimum is owned in foreign countries. Now, the reality is it's probably significantly higher than 9.8%. We just can only say with a reasonable degree of confidence that we know that it's at least 9.8%. Now, some of you may say, well, wait a second, it says North America is 58.3%. That should leave, you know, uh, over 40% unexplained. And the answer is that the data source that is being used to present this graph does not have full and complete data. So what you don't want to do, you do not want to focus on the North American percentage and then subtract that from 100 or anything like that. You want to just focus on what we can affirmatively say about other continents. In this case, we can say 9.8% of Uber stock, if not more, is owned in foreign countries, and therefore that's well above 5%. It easily meets the aggregate threshold for foreign ownership. I'm going to repeat this now with another company. So I go into search quotes, and I'm gonna type Amazon. And if you happen to know the stock ticker, you can just type that as an abbreviation. And here's Amazon Incorporated. And we're gonna scroll down. We're gonna do the same thing. 
We're going to go to ownership and we're going to see Amazon. Similar type of numbers right away. We've got 7.6% in Europe, 1% in Asia, 0.2% in Australasia. So that's 8.8% at least owned abroad. So Amazon would also meet the aggregate foreign ownership threshold. Now we're going to look for 1% individual foreign owners. When I say individual, I don't mean a, a human individual. I mean a single foreign investor. So let's go back to Uber. We're still at CNBC.com, and I'm going to search on Uber Technologies. So we're going to do the same thing where we scroll down to ownership. But instead of looking at the map, we're going to look at top institutional shareholders. And you'll see that Uber has one single foreign investor, actually two, that exceed 1% foreign ownership. Now, take a moment to look at this yourself, but only a moment. I don't know if you saw them, but I see at least two. So there's one that should be relatively easy, which is here. You can see Morgan Stanley Investment Management Singapore. That has the word Singapore in the name. That makes it pretty obvious. And you can see that that branch of Morgan Stanley Investment Management, the Singapore-based entity, owns 1.4% of shares. But also what you may not have noticed is Public Investment Fund. The full name of that is the Public Investment Fund of Saudi Arabia. It's the Saudi government's sovereign oil wealth fund. It owns 3.6% of Uber. So it's always helpful if you can point out as many as possible uh, single foreign investors that own 1% or more. Even if it triggers the 5% threshold, we like to identify particular 1% foreign investors. Here we've got two examples. Now I also want to show you, if you scroll down, there's this mutual fund holder list. Now we don't uh, we don't look at the, the people who own uh, uh, shares in the mutual funds. We just look at the mutual fund itself. And in this case, you can see there's one that's actually a foreign mutual fund. It's, I'm not sure how to pronounce this in uh, Norwegian, Staten's Pension Fund Utland. It's a Norwegian pension fund, again, based on the country's sovereign oil wealth, and it owns 1.2% of the shares. So here we have uh, three different foreign investors that each own 1% or more of Uber. Uh, and in addition, of course, to its aggregate 5% foreign ownership, that shows how they qualify. I want to show you another example here. Let's look at Morgan Stanley the financial firm. Now you may be wondering, how would you have known that Staten's Pension Fund Utland or Public Investment Fund of Saudi Arabia are foreign funds? And the answer is, uh, with time and with practice, you Google them and you find out what they are. Now here, for example, for Morgan Stanley, you can see that 22.6% of its shares are owned by Mitsubishi UFJ Financial Group Incorporated. Well, let's Google that and see what that is. And we can see just from the, the Google hits that it is a, a company based in Japan. So what that means is that uh, it's a Japanese bank holding and financial service company headquartered in Chiyoda, Tokyo, Japan. So what that means is that Morgan Stanley is 22.6% owned by this particular foreign investor. And that's a great data point. We can also scroll down and see if we see anything uh, obvious uh, here in the Mutual fund list, you can see that Staten's Pension Fund Utland uh, is in the sort of top 10 list, but it only has 0.7%. So that's not quite enough to qualify. A third example I want to show you is Chevron, the uh, oil company. And again, if we were to look at its geographic ownership, we would see it easily uh, meets that 5% aggregate threshold. When you look at its individual foreign investors, uh, you might get a little excited down here when you see Norges Bank Investment Management. That is, that's the a different Norwegian bank, but it just barely misses the threshold right now, 0.9%. If you come back to this on a different day, maybe it'll be 1.0%. Uh, that can vary depending on whether they buy or sell stock. If you scroll down and look at the mutual funds, you will see, again, there's our friend Staten's Pension Fund Utland, the other Norwegian fund, and it's also at 0.9%. So in this case, Chevron just barely doesn't seem to have uh, an individual 1% foreign investor. So you can go through multiple examples like that. Sometimes you'll find a particular 1% foreign investor. Sometimes you won't. And some of them stand out. They're pretty obvious. Sometimes they're less obvious. 
So it, what this requires is that over time, as you do it, when you look up a company, you'll learn more about it. So now I want to give an example of one that's really not obvious to most people. So if you look up Excel, which is Excel Energy Company, you look through, you go to the ownership tab, and you look through its list of top shareholders, you might not notice any of these companies standing out as uh, seeming foreign sounding. Now, if you look at MFS investment management, and if you Google that, what you will find is that MFS investment management is an American-based global investment manager. Okay, so MFS investment management is itself American. I believe it used to stand for Massachusetts Financial Services, but when you research it further, you will find that its parent is Sun Life Financial, which is a Canadian insurance company. And under our policy, if a company like MFS is itself 50% or more owned by a, a definitely foreign company like Sun Life, the Canadian company, then we count that as a triggering foreign investment. So we would say that MFS investment management counts because and I'm not going to walk through the full research on MFS and Sun Life here because it would make the video take too long, but MFS is a subsidiary of Sun Life. So what that means is that MFS's investment in uh, this energy company, Excel Energy, is functionally Sun Life's investment in Excel Energy. So we would say that Excel Energy triggers it because it's 2.0% owned by MFS Investment Management, which is itself a 50% or more subsidiary of Sun Life, a Canadian company. I want to show you something else, which is that we don't want to rely only on CNBC because its data isn't necessarily the whole story. So here we are, we're looking at Excel Energy. And if you recall, when you look at the list of the top institutional holders, uh, it lists the top 10. And when you get down to number 10, it owns 1.3% of the shares of Excel Energy. Well, what if the 11th largest institutional shareholder owns 1.2% and it's foreign. We would not know that from CNBC. So there's another website that we'll use sometimes to supplement the research, which is MSN Finance. So if you go to MSN Finance, the website is a little confusing because you'll see there's two different search windows. There's this one, which you don't want to use, and this one, which you do, where it says search stocks, ETFs, and more. So we're going to type Excel Energy, and we're going to look at its investors. And if you scroll down, it's going to list the top shareholders. It may not have the exact same data as what you saw on CNBC, but it should be pretty close. And as we scroll down, we're going to see, well, this is interesting. I don't remember seeing the Royal Bank of Canada on the CNBC list, and it apparently owns 1.60%. And you can even click this See More, and we'll scroll down. And we can see other companies that we may need to look up because we may need to see exactly where is Northern Trust? Where is legal and general? We can Google them. We see here Deutsche Bank. Uh, I don't know if that's uh, officially a German company. We would need to look it up more detail, but we can see it's 0.97%. So it's just under the threshold. So the point is that by using MSN Finance, sometimes we can generate more investors than we would just by looking at CNBC. So when you're trying to put together the full picture of a company, use this website as well. Now I want to talk about some other companies that you might be thinking of and show you some of the limits of this method. So let's go back to CNBC. I think it's a better starting point. And let's look into In-N-Out Burger. It's a California-based fast food chain. And huh, there are no suggested symbols for In-N-Out Burger. What does that mean? That means that In-N-Out Burger is not publicly traded. If we Google it, we'll find some information about it. And you can always start at Wikipedia. I wouldn't end there, but it's usually a, a decent starting point. And if you start reading the article, you'll see that the owner is actually uh, the grandchild of the founders. So this is a privately held company, uh, and there's no reason to suspect that uh, Lindsay Snyder is not a U.S. citizen. So we're going to say that we don't have any evidence to believe that In-N-Out Burger would qualify. Well, let's, let's look at Coke Industries, because that's a company that a lot of people have concerns about. And 
And we can see a lot of articles about it, but there was no, there's no stock ticker symbol for it because again, that's not publicly traded. And when we Google it, we're gonna see, oh, we can already see even from this preview, it is the second largest privately held company in the United States. So you can't buy stock in Coke Industries, even if you want to. And what you will see if you read about it is that there are different uh, descendants of the original founders uh, that own various percentages. So uh, unless you have some reason to believe that one of these is uh, not a US citizen, then Coke Industries is not gonna qualify as a foreign influenced company. So this method uh, sometimes requires you to look uh, more deeply into particular companies in order to find evidence about them. Now, one last example you might wonder about is sometimes you end up actually finding a company that is itself foreign. So I'm just gonna give an example of Novartis, which is a pharmaceutical company. So how would you know whether Novartis is a US company or not? It's, it's very global. So when you go to its website, and every company has a different way that they organize their website, but usually they're going to have something somewhere on their website where they have a link for investors. It might be about the corporation, it might be investors, but this is going to have some information. And here you can see their fourth quarter and full year results and annual report. And I can already see Basel, Switzerland. Well, that's a little weird because US companies don't base their annual report in Basel, Switzerland. And you can see the investors event calendar, again, Basel, Switzerland. And if you go through and read some of these documents that are intended for investors, uh, you will quickly learn that Novartis is in fact a Swiss company. So that means that it's not even a question of being a foreign influenced company. It is a foreign company. It is actually already prohibited under federal law from spending in elections. What our legislation will make it do is that companies in which Novartis takes a stake, Novartis buys 1% of some other company, then that company is unable to spend money in US elections as well. Thank you so much for that amazing video, Ron. It is so informative, and I'm so glad we are recording this call so that people can go back and re, you know, watch this if they need to afterwards. Um, so next, we're going to do our own research. So everybody on the call, um, hopefully you know which company you are um, going to research. I emailed you. A lot of people wanted Amazon or Google or the big companies, so but we couldn't, we're not gonna, you know, repeat efforts. So we tried to do a list and um, you can find out who, which company you are following here. I just sent the link. Um, and Cindy's asking, Ron, are you going to share just this video standalone? I can't remember what was decided on that. Yes, uh, we, we can we can share it standalone. And furthermore, you may have noticed that I was talking rather quickly, and that's partly because I sped the video up to fit into uh, the allowed time. And uh, the video that we'll share later uh, will be at a normal pace of speech. Okay, so if you do not know which company you were assigned, please enter in the chat and we will try to link you up to it. But I do have a page where it just listed everybody who RSVP'd for this call with the company we had assigned you. So before we get started with you guys doing um, your walkthrough, just let's take another minute and make sure everybody knows their company. Do not know, Renee, okay, here, hold on, Renee. You have Netflix, Renee. See. Okay, great. You got it. <laughs> Anyone else? Cindy Black. Oh, I think I gave you one in Seattle. Starbucks, because you're in Seattle. <laughs> what if I already know that they are? <laughs> well, we want to gather the info. I mean, you could quickly do that um, and fill out another one. Um, you can see who is already chosen here on this list. Again, for everybody, here is where I put your names if you RSVP'd. Um, Terry Irish, let's see, Terry, you are, um, American International Group, AIG, 
And Amira, let's see, you said you didn't sign up to get one. So let me assign you one that has not been taken. Um, actually, somebody, I know somebody, a couple of people accidentally got two because they didn't see my first email. Um, so why don't, Amira, why don't I have you do Duke Energy, which somebody had a... Um, Mira Matar. Oh my goodness. Terry worked for AIG, who he's going to look at. How fantastic. What a great coincidence. <laughs> okay. James Pearson, you are going to be Pacific Gas and Electric. PG, PCG is their ticker code. Great. I, yes. I would. Wonderful. Um, so let me put in just um, anybody else. Oh, Ravi, I signed you up for Estee Lauder. And Gordon, yes, you're muted. Do you need to know yours? I did Fresnius Medical Care for you. Okay. Okay, Amira Duke Energy. Um, okay, anybody else or should we get going? That so while you're doing it, I want to give you the form to fill out um so you can see where you can you'll be able to actually gather the information that Ron went through. Um, does everybody see that link to the form to fill out? Okay, and so I guess I'm gonna start sharing my screen as I walk through this. Um, wait, let me see who I should do. <laughs> Let's see. I will do 3M company, which has not. So I will share my screen and walk through this at the same time and kind of hover my thing as we go. Um, share screen. Okay. Okay, great. So here we go to CNBC and dot com, and I'm going to do 3M company. You put in yours. And then when you get to your company, hopefully you all got, were able to find your company. And I'm going to remind you again. So the things we're going to be filling out are on this form. So you'll put your name, your email, your email, your name, which company and their ticker code. And first we're gonna look up their headquarters. So I'm looking at 3M. So I would fill out and put, oh, St. Paul, Minnesota. I would go back and fill it in here. Then I'm gonna go, to, now we wanna find the ownership. So here's mine. So. Just below this graph, you'll find the ownership button. Did everybody see that? Summary news, profile, earnings, peers, financials, options, ownership. You can all see that, right? With my screen share, hopefully. Okay. Then we get to the map. So when you're filling in your form, like if actually maybe I should have my form open over here. So. Um, you know, so you can go in and fill it out as you go. What is the percentage aggregate European? I'd put in 9.4. What is the Asian aggregate? 1.3. You know, you for the one you're doing, you go through and fill these, these out. Holly, can I ask a question? Yes, please do. Uh -huh. um, I've I've got stuck on um, getting on this CNBC website and not and missing or putting what I thought was my company into the search and not getting 
the page that shows you all this information that you're okay uh, great then let's start there so everybody who's got it keep going and if people are in the same position as Mary Beth let's go back to the home page so you can see my screen I'm going back so which is your company JP Morgan Chase okay so I'm putting in JP Morgan Chase so here this is their CDS well see when I do that I'm getting articles coming up right there was um JP oh I think I also put in I think I also put in JPM is actually your ticker symbol. So let's put that right in. Let's see. Okay. Let's see what we get then. Oh, okay. So now I see it comes up. Um, so, uh, one tip is um, if you are not finding the stock ticker symbol, if you just Google JP Morgan Chase, um, then the Google results will show you a, a little page that says, that its stock ticker is JPM. So if you're just having trouble finding the stock ticker, you know, Google can give you that type of information. And then you can look that up on CNBC. Perfect. Okay, so we need the stock tipper, not necessarily the name of the company to get the right page to come up. Yeah, if you wanna make sure. So, I, and that's why if you saw on my thing, I all next to your name and the company, I did include the ticker. Um, so that you're looking at the right company, but okay. So back to here we are. So, oops, that's the Microsoft page versus, okay. So again, for, if people were at this stage as well, if you're oh. doing well, just keep doing and <laughs> fill out your form. <laughs> I, was filling now, hmm? I was filling out the form first. I should have gotten on CNBC. <laughs> Oh yeah, you for yeah, go to CNBC and make sure you're doing your company. I can't even well, I have your shared screen, but I can't get behind. Okay, it. which company are you? Who is talking since hey, um hey, I, this is Terry? Terry. Okay, Terry Irish. Just do a B of just, AIG. Yeah. So then you will just catch everybody up. So you would do AIG here on CNBC. And then we would click here. And then first we'll find their headquarters, you know. So in the form yeah. that we had, we wanted, you know, your <laughs> info, which company, and then which headquarters. Um, yeah, I was trying to get them both together. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. then after this, near this, you see ownership. This is where we're going to get our map. So now we will click on ownership of your company. I know they hold stocks all over the world. Yeah. And here you see the uh map. So then okay. as you go in on your form, you'll fill in European aggregate. So okay. for AIG, we see 9.3% Europe, Asia 1%. So we can fill that all in as we go. Um, I'm lost. Um, yeah. How, do I, how yeah. do I get uh, uh, to a place where I could uh, enter information? That's this form, which I will share again in the chat now. Well, I was doing <laughs> while you were. Yeah. Stuff. Okay. I mean, everybody's at different levels. So this is why we're doing it in plans. I'm on an iPad, so it, it doesn't. Yeah. Work. So here is the form to do your uh, follow them to fill it in. So how do you do I had it. So. Um, I, I added it in the chat. Do you see the link? Yeah. Um, is that the link? It's it's this um, docs.google.com forms, you'll see. And then it will look like this one. Um, Do you see that, Marianne? No. Um, And so where's the on top of another at this point? <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Um oh okay. So okay. Um, so Mary, you got the form now? 
I, I think so. Okay, perfect. And then this is Megan, and I came late and may have missed something, but when okay. I put put uh, Marathon Oil into CNBC, okay, uh, I didn't get this same thing. <laughs> okay, so Marathon Oil. So I will help you with Marathon Oil. So we'll put up Marathon Oil. We know the ticker is MPC. So we click here, right? I didn't get that page even. Okay, so go to cnbc.com here. Cnbc.com. Maybe I just went to the wrong place. I don't know. Okay. And then you see at the top, are you there now? Um, just a minute, let me follow. Mm -hmm. Okay, up at the top, there's the search quotes, and news and videos. That's where you put that's Marathon where you oil. put it in. So you put in MPC because that's the ticker for the New York Stock Exchange ticker and it'll pull it up. Are you on this? Yeah, I see that. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. And you have your form as well, right? On yeah, I, I found the form. Fine. Great. Just fine. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So then, you know, you'll fill in your info and then you'll see their headquarters here. And next to the head near the headquarters, maybe yours looks a little different, is this ownership. And that's where we find that wonderful map. And with the map, then we can start to fill out the form we created. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have another question. Sure, Mary Beth. Yeah. Um, when, so I went through and, um, you know, from the map and could tell how much, um, uh, you know, Asia, Africa and everything owns, but because North America combines Canada and the United States, um, does it do? Does the total percentage foreign aggregate ownership from that map doesn't include Canadian ownership? So do we have to do a separate search to no, find? No, because this we just. I mean, this is the great thing about the laws that we're trying, the bills we're trying to pass. You know, it just has to exceed five percent aggregate or okay. one percent single owner. So once we're, you know, it really only matters if it's close. But a lot okay. of these we're seeing are way above. And as Ron said in the beginning of the video, it can change every day. Stocks are bought and sold. But we can say okay. as of this date, there is clearly, you know, at least 5% foreign ownership. You know, a lot of these, most of these multinationals will give us that. Um, so that's, you know, Mine added up without Canada to 8.1%. But Perfect. Here, yep. here's yep. another question. As I go down, yes, so I have more than 5%, but then it says, if yes, how much and who? So now do I write down the individual? If Canada there was, a, for Canada? example, yeah, for example, I'm at Marathon Oil here now. Um, and we saw that you can see my screen, Staten's Pension Fund Utland is at 1%. So that would go in the 1% question. Um, if it's if it's not, you know, if you don't have a company specifically, it's okay. I didn't make those required. I guess what I'm confused about is you asked it kind of twice. So you ask, yeah. do you identify 5%? You said, yes, if yes, how much and who? And then, yeah. and then you ask, do you identify any 1%? If yes, how much and who? So yeah. you go into the question after, did you identify any 5% foreign owners? So if for, you... Yeah. So for example, with the one I'm on with Marathon Oil, I don't see any that is, you know, that I know exactly is foreign owned, but except for Staten's pension for, fund, and that is at one plus 1%. So I would just do the second, you know, the first questions for the 5% owner, the second one's for the one percent owner. So we would. Oh, put I see. You mean a single ben. owner? Yeah. So we just I got confused. Okay. Yeah, so that I know to identify any five percent, any one yeah, owner. Then, then yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know if for your you were which company? Oh, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, and it did say that European aggregate ownership was seven percent. So I guess it's possible. I have to look now. Yeah. To see any one and, owner. Yeah. And again, this will change. So we just want, you know, if we are clearly above 5% foreign ownership, you know, or one company, 1%, you know, one. 
I got it. Okay. Just they can notice. they can wield their um yeah. You know, they can make a call to the hey, you know, we want to have influence here or there, you know. So yeah, yours also had Staten Pension Fund Utland um at one plus. So mm. so they would be in the one percent. Yeah. More. And somebody asked, Ron, what do you think? Coca-Cola has five symbols. Um, do we just do the main one? Uh, yeah, let me look it up. Hold on a sec. Oh, I see some people have hands up as well. Okay. <laughs> it looks like it's KO is the Coca-Cola Corporation. And then Mary Saxtetter, do you have a question? Yeah, so I'm doing Marathon, but I'm doing Marathon Petroleum, which might be different than yours. Um, uh, but where I'm running into problem on the form is the 1% foreign owners. So when I go into... Um, all the investors that they have, and I'm looking them up. Uh, so for example, I'm looking at, um, it's called Hotchkiss and Wiley. Mm -hmm. And at that point, and for all of them, I haven't been able to get down to individual foreign owners, but Hotchkiss and Wiley has a London office, um, which leads me to believe that they have, you know, a uh, you know, uh, foreign, uh, and so how do I, that's the point where I'm at, where I don't know quite how to proceed. Ron, did you, did you catch that whole question as well? Yeah. So, uh, you know, the question about, um, is Hotchkiss and Wiley foreign? So that's basically, um, so what you have to do is you have to go to their website and like poke around a bit. So like I'm on it, it's hwcm.com. Right, that's I'm the, on it too. Yeah. Uh, and you know, you can see under who we are, they have history. Um, and... no, I'm not finding, uh, all I was able to find was on the contact us that they have a London non-US office yeah so um, i don't know what percentage is for there's, there's a page on meet our team um but those are investors those aren't like ownership people those are uh no i see like the executive chairman and so forth um but if uh you know at, at some point it, it becomes like a question of how long are you going to spend digging on this um so mike sozen from the center for american progress says he often spends you know, 15, 20 minutes just looking at one investor, you know, going around their their website. So the good news is sometimes you find one easy foreign investor and then you don't necessarily have to go through all the others. But if you're really, you know, struggling um, to find, uh, you know, uh, even a single one, then it, it can take longer. Um, yeah. But you, you just have to keep poking around their websites. Uh, and but this, for is this why exercise, I'm by the way, when people what ask us, if us to do. people like, you know, can you tell us whether such and such is a foreign influence corporation? It's like sometimes it can take like a solid half an hour to answer that question. Mm -hmm. And, and for the purpose of this exercise, what do you want us to do? Holly, that's more up to you. <laughs> so yeah, so you, I, I'm looking at uh, Marathon Petroleum. I guess there's a Marathon and Oil. So Marathon Petroleum definitely has Stoughton's Pension Fund. So it would be, now let me look up the Marathon Oil. By the way, to answer the question on Hotchkiss, what I'm seeing on their Contact Us page is that they list Los Angeles as their headquarters. Right. Uh, and then a second office in Corona Del Mar and then a London non-US office. So it's right. probably the case that their American investments are made through, you know, the U.S. office. Okay, so, so that I, wouldn't qualify. Okay. I, I wouldn't count it because um, we don't really have any reason to think that it's the London branch or even that it's a sort of separate entity from the U.S. one. I think London is a satellite office. Okay. Um, uh, I have a question. I've got one that I guess was easy. It's uh, Fresnius 
and it's based in Elsa Krüne Strasse 1, Bad Homburg, Deutschland. So I guess it's 100% foreign. That sure sounds like it. <laughs> yeah, well. Yeah, and then Mary, to answer your question, we also have a not sure, you know, that's why I put with your findings with this corporation be prohibited. And so you can, I mean, you're, you can just leave if yes, and how much and who, but if, you know, if there were the percentages of Asia was high enough for that one um, in Europe, Europe was 6.7. So you could just leave those blank, like you could say, no, I didn't identify any 5% owner. And leave well, yeah, them. I did 6.7 no, European but, aggregate. Yeah, yeah, but your findings would be, they would be prohibited because Europe is 6.7 alone. So right, I passed that though. I'm down below in the questionnaire where it says, did you identify any 1% foreign owner? Right, so then just say no. Okay. But in the bottom, the last absolute question with your findings, would this corporation be prohibited? Yes, they would be prohibited okay. because we know that they have 6%, 6.7 Europe and 1.4 Asia and 0.3. I mean, that's over 5%. Can I ask something about that map that you were looking okay. at there? Uh -huh. um, you know, they've got, they've got a uh, little, uh, arrows going to Africa, but they don't have a percentage. Then that's and, just a zero. I mean, it's minimal. You see Australia is just 0.3. So just leave it blank with for Aust South Central. Yeah, South South Central, Central, sometimes, Central. sometimes they will have a number and sometimes they won't. So if they do that, just leave it, just put a zero. Put a zero. Okay. Leave it blank, yeah. Um, and then I wanted, so you guys can keep finishing that on your own. You're probably almost all done at this point with the form. And the great thing is I'll be able to collate all of our responses and share them with folks. But I quickly also wanted to just show you how to follow the money with one California ballot initiative as an example. Hey, before you leave that, could I just ask one quick question? Mm -hmm. I'm looking at these individual investors and if their corporate headquarters are in the United States, can we pretty much assume they're a U.S. owned corporation then, and and you know not not go deep, deep, dig deeper into their? No, ownership? it's because they're U.S. This is the whole point. These are a lot of them are U.S. corporations, but we're trying to find out if they have foreign influence. So that's oh, just, I just mean, I mean the individual, like the the companies that sh that own a part of the company I'm looking for. Um, I'm trying to find out who owns those companies and it's not so easy. And I wondered if those, so even if those companies are in Boston or LA, that does not mean those companies are not foreign owned. Right. It's, companies it's not, own not a hundred percent. That's why it can be the digging, but for, okay. the, for the bill, since it's just the 5% aggregate, if they have, you know, in the map over 5% elsewhere, clearly they would already be. So we don't have to get too hung up with trying to find whether the one there's a yeah you know, not too much I think okay. it more simple okay. as long as you know and there is that you don't know you might have your answer could be like I don't know if they will if they would be disqualified and that's fine you know okay so next I just quickly we don't have you know already at the hour but I wanted to quickly show for people in California I thought this would be interesting and I'm choosing. California Prop 22 on ballotpedia.org. So on, I'll send everybody this link. Um, so we are going to see why this. So there was a law that was passed in California to protect labor rights, but some a gig, you know, some of the gig companies, Uber and Lyft, did not like that they were going to have to give their drivers certain rights. So they are basically undoing a law that had passed through the California legislature, and they put this on the ballot, and they spent lots of money on this. So we're going on this page, we're going to scroll way down, campaign finance section. Companies spent almost $200 million to fight this law that existed. And if you look at who donated, 
these five companies, Uber spent 51 million, DoorDash spent 51 million, Lyft spent 47 million, Instacart spent 31 million, and Postmates spent 11 million. They all wanted to undo this law. And you can read about the law and what it was doing if you already don't know about it. But this is, you know, as we found out, Uber was a foreign influence company. Um, so we're seeing, you know, you just don't know if there's people behind the scenes who are trying to, you know, undo these laws. I mean, the, all of the founding fathers were like, there should be no foreign money. That's why, you know, the US AID case, you know, showed with, you know, that there should be zero or, you know, the three cases that were in the in the beginning of the video, like, you know, even Brett Kavanaugh, Justice Kavanaugh, you know, said there should be no, you know, even a $50 donation was too much. <laughs> so here, these foreign influence companies are creating laws. This bill, this proposition passed because they, you know, they just poured money on this issue. <laughs> um, yeah. So Renee is saying Lyft has 20.7 foreign ownership. There you go. So they don't care about our workers. You know, are we wanted to protect California workers? So this is happening a lot. There's a new bill actually with food um, workers where the state passed a law to protect, you know, for food workers and a handful of companies are, you know, going to spend millions to try to undo this law. So that's why this is important. We need to stop the foreign influence of in our elections. And just for those people, there's one other site that um, I wanted to tell people about to find. I used this a lot, long time ago in the past to look up ownership of some real estate companies. So Corporation Wiki. So this I did, I'm just pulling up and sharing and people can go to this page or the site and look up companies that are private. Um, so Coke Industries, you know, famous uh, big donor <laughs> in elections. So then you would go, you know, you can look up the key people and locations and filings and try to sleuth, you know, are any of them foreign, you know, so. I, I know that we're getting past time, so I wanted to re be respectful of that. Um, and let me stop sharing my screen for a second. Okay. Does anybody else, I mean, I'm happy to stay on and answer more questions if people have more questions. I also wanted to see how many people submitted their results and we could look through that together. Um, let me just hide people's emails. <laughs> I guess I can, um, let me share a screen again. So this is great. We have a lot of people had done their results and we can see like, um, you know, Uber would be disqualified. Let me, let me make these a little smaller, but, um, Costco would uh, not be disqualified, research saying, but um, DoorDash would be. Duke, we got a not sure yet. Intuit would be disqualified. Fresnius would be disqualified. Estee Lauder would be disqualified. Starbucks would be disqualified. Netflix would be disqualified. Marathon Oil would be disqualified. Boeing would not be disqualified. Um, Lowe's would be, Chubb Limited would be, um, Raytheon, not sure, but um, so this just gives you an example of, you know, these companies would not be able to spend in our elections. So, okay. And, and I'm so excited that all of you came to participate. And if you want to do more, you can always keep going and use this form. 
um, and you can see who we assigned different companies, but um, Michelle, oh, the last thing I want to share, if you are a Californian, we have one week before the Appropriations Committee decides, um, so also please go. If we get out of the suspense file and onto a floor vote. So please if go to our, our home page, Money Out Voters In, and call the appropriations offices and tell them that, you know, we should have zero foreign money in our elections and for them to please pass AB 83 out of the appropriations suspense file. And today's a perfect day because Michelle is in Sacramento, <laughs> getting in the offices, talking to them. Working yes, and in fact, our 3.30 meeting is with the office of Speaker Anthony Rendon, who is okay. the most critical person to hear from you. So yeah. um, please give him a shout at, I believe it's 916-319-2041. Hold on, my trusted deputy here, Diane Mosley, is checking to make sure no, I've got the right have, for two. Two zero six two. 2062. Thank you. 916-319-2062. So please make that call. Um, right around three o'clock would be great. And I've just added them in the chat so you can grab all these numbers. They're also on our, you know, on our homepage here. Let me, I'll add Rendon. Oh yeah. And Rendon's there too. So yes, Rendon and Chris chair of the appropriations committee are the two most critical players and he's 916 319 oh, 2041 i believe yeah it's here in the chat i put all the great numbers. okay good yeah those are the two most critical uh players and special shout out to megan shumway if megan's still on the call megan and her husband dale helped us uh deliver all uh, 120 books of uh, Senator Whitehouse's The Scheme, how the, how the right wing used dark money to capture the Supreme Court to every member of the California legislature. Um, and that was just a spectacular, a spectacular. Uh, Way to go, Megan. Thank you, Megan. <laughs> yes, indeed. And, yeah, right. and, I, and I really wanted to thank Ron for making that amazing video and we will share the link with you guys so that if you need to see this again um and we just really appreciate your support on this bill yes, oh i indeed. think even oh steven's clapping not hands up okay gordon has his hand up <laughs> um, a couple of days ago uh, uh monday went to a meeting of the California Alliance for Retired Americans. We're trying to increase our presence in Solano County. And uh, I believe a representative for Wendy Carrillo was, uh, was making a presentation. And I, I did not realize that she was on the Appropriations Committee. So I discussed AB uh, 83 with with this group and she said oh i i i don't think my boss would um would be opposed to this and it turns out yeah this this boss is on this uh, uh appropriations committee that turned it down so it was a nice chance to put a little heat on one of these uh foot draggers thank you gordon boy that's yeah. wonderful and um <laughs> We um, actually had a really nice meeting with a staffer of, of Wendy Carrillo. So um, we are hopeful that um, she is uh, going to be on board with this, both to tell uh, Speaker uh, Rendon and Chair Holden. Um, when she, interestingly, um, she's leaving the legislature to run for um, a, a Los Angeles City Council seat. Um, so, uh, she may, uh, uh, make this one of her, um, last great acts in, in the California legislature. Okay. Well, this, this person is from Northern California and I don't re remember the person's name, unfortunately. You mean the staffer or? 
of the the assembly person is. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you said it was Wendy. I thought you said it was Carrillo, who's down in in L.A. Oh, okay. did I misunderstand I, that? I, I I I blew it. It could be any of the other uh, uh, All right. ladies on the list. Well, um, uh, let me know, Gordon. You've got my email, I believe. That would be great information. Yes. I'd love to hear who it is. So chase that down. Would be would be good. Okay. Thank you. And I, I also attached a fact sheet to, that I've developed with what I thought was the latest information about what people can do to support AB 83. And it's I'd love to see that. Oh, great. You put it in the chat. We'll grab that then. Okay. Thanks, Gordon. All right. Anybody else? Hey. Yeah, any other uh, I just want to thank Holly and Michelle and Money Out Voters In and everyone who joined this call for being so dedicated uh, and helping to push forward on this important policy. It's really an inspiration. Thanks, Ron. You're the best. And that video just is awesome. So we'll be sharing that, um, I think, as a standalone. Is that true? Can we share it as a standalone? Uh, I'm, actually, I'm actually going to make a version that's not sped up quite so much. so people. Right. Can I heard it. that. Okay. okay. It, it'll That's be great. a little bit longer, but it'll be easier to understand. Okay. Wonderful. And we'll make a page on our site where we share it with the instructions and all of this. And thank you, Alexandra and Oski for also hosting. Indeed. <laughs> okay. We'll have Wonderful. a great rest of the day. All right. Okay, and let's you. pass AB 83. Yes. California. Next Next week, we'll have an update whether it comes out of the appropriations next week, this time. We will. <laughs> Dionysus hasta lumbago. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Gordon. Thank you. Yeah, you All right, take care, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Bye.